singing together. Thank you for coming this Sunday. God is up in heaven saying, yay, they're here. They're ready to rejoice and celebrate and sing and congregate together. Thank you for coming this Sunday. So if you'd stand with me, we're going to sing a song that really today is about thanking God for who he is and the goodness and, and the blessings that he has given us. And that's what this Sunday is about. Good morning. It's so good to be with you this morning. It's so good to see your lovely faces for those of you that are here, and it's so, we're so glad you've joined us online for those that are doing that. Um, my name is Pastor Ryan. I've got a couple of announcements for us. Uh, the first is, as uh, many have probably seen through Pastor Josh's uh, weekly update and then also on our Facebook page, um, as part of our Connect, Grow, Serve, uh, we're wanting to continue to help people 
find ways that they can get involved in volunteering, get involved in giving back to the church. And so we've created this nice volunteer uh, application form. For those of you that are here in the service, there are actually some out on the registration desk. You can grab one of those. And there's all kinds of uh, information there as far as for information of contacting you, make sure we've got your proper information, but then all the different areas that you could volunteer and be a part of. Um, and so if uh, yeah, if you'd like to be, a fall, be involved, feel free to pick one of those up. Uh, it's also, as I said, on our Facebook page, so you can grab it there uh, for those of you visiting with us online. Uh, the next thing, so for those of you that drove by the 3rd Street entrance today, you might have noticed that this last week we got our 3rd Street steps poured in for the building project. Um, I got to, yeah, we can clap for that. I got to enjoy seeing this week on the inside as most of our interior house lights and stage lights have been going up. Um, and so we're getting some fun pieces happening that each day it's just a little bit more exciting. And so there's wonderful things happening there. Um, along with that and kind of a tie into the volunteer, there are lots of projects, lots of things that uh, we're going to try to tackle ourselves, and so if there's something that you feel like you might be able to help with, if there's just some spare time that you've got in a week that you're like, hey, I, I could give a couple hours, really it doesn't matter your skill level, I could probably find something ranging from, you know, little pieces as far as just sweeping up, cleaning around areas that we're trying to make clean, all the way up to if you're a professional carpenter, I've got some of that that we still need. So, um, let me know, and uh, we'll be happy to get you involved and tied in so that we can get this project wrapped up. And then the last announcement for today, and I'm going to call it, so we have a celebration Sunday coming up. And now this is not the building celebration. That will be coming up too, but we have a celebration Sunday, September 13th. It's going to be a Sunday of baptisms, baby dedications, and testimonies. And so if you uh, would be, in, if you're interested in being baptized or have a newborn that you would like dedicated or have a testimony, um, Talk to Pastor Josh or contact the church office as we're scheduling that and getting uh, all those pieces planned in. So that's our updates for today. Let's continue to worship together now. If you'd stand with me again. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me, who the sun sets free. Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, he's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my heart. Child. 
It's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening
today is a day to talk about his goodness. So as we sing this song, just think about through your life. The times he's been there when it's just plain exciting. Good things are happening and you just want to thank him for his goodness. But then also I want you to think about the times that he's been good to you when things have been rough. And that's the time we need to praise him too and thank him for how he's leading us through that time and how he's holding us and guiding us. So think about that while we sing this. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. that you were thankful for 
things that he has done for you, how he has held you, how he's listened to you cry or he listen to you rejoice. Share that with him. Honor him with your love. Enjoy it. Enjoy hearing your children speak love to you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. It's good to, good to see you all here. Um, so before we get started, today we are wrapping up our unexpected uh, sermon series, and um, I just wanted to share a little unexpected adventure that I had yesterday. Uh, Stuart knows a little bit about this, but Valerie wanted to uh, put up some shelving units, and so we ordered the brackets on Amazon, went and got the wood. They all came yesterday, so... I'm getting ready to, to put these shelves up in our laundry room area and uh, figure out where they're going to go, drill in the holes for all of the little anchors that go in the sheetrock. And, uh, you know, I get one side done, go to the other, and one, you know, goes right in really easy. I knew I needed an anchor. Another one, I'm like, oh, I think I'm, I might have hit just the edge of a stud. So I go over a little bit, and I'm like, okay, I can get a screw in there. Go to the other side, goes right in, I'll need an anchor. The next one, I go in, and it kind of hits something and goes sideways. I oh, must have hit another stud. So I come back out and I go to drill again, and all of a sudden, there's just this loud explosion. The drill shoots out of the hole. There's smoke. There's like charred all around the hole. The lights flicker. I was like, what just happened? Like, I'm terrified. I look at my drill bit. It's half the size that it used to be. It's black. It's all melted. I was like, oh my gosh, I need to call Stuart. So I called Stuart, and he comes over, and he gets his little saw and cuts it open, I should have bought a lottery ticket. I, I don't gamble, don't worry. But I drilled right through the main line, service line to the house and a hole almost all the way through it. So I don't know what the odds of that are or the odds that I'm alive or that my drill still works somehow. But uh, I was not expecting that to happen. I was thinking I was putting up a little bookshelf on the wall and it turned into a whole new adventure. So last night I laid there half awake, just God, please don't let this house burn down. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, you never know what to expect in life, right? Um, as we get started today, I just want to say how happy I am to be here with you today. And uh, Valerie and I were talking about this uh, last night, actually coming home from some people's house. And uh, we just feel so blessed by the relationship that we have with, with you and, and this, this community and this church and just the way that we've truly grown to love and appreciate all of you and, and being with you and sharing life together and sharing Jesus together with our community and just the things that we see God continuing to do in this church. And uh, this last week has been a little bit of a whirlwind. You know, I've kind of gotten used to things being going slow and not a whole lot happening. It's COVID and all of a sudden it feels like you know, the afterburners are on, and we just have so much stuff that's getting ready to start, and really exciting things I can't wait to, to share with you in the next few weeks, but different partnerships that we're looking at with the community and ways to reach out and to some creative ways to share the gospel, and, it, and it's exciting because I feel like we've made this transition to where we're in this weird season that I feel like we've all kind of hoped would just end really quick. And, and it didn't end very quickly. How many of you thought we would still be going through all of this at this point in the year? A, a few of you? I, I definitely was like, no, there's no way. We'll be done. You know, two weeks, right? And, uh, and so we were trying to figure out life. 
and I feel like there's people that are really getting excited now and saying, okay, this is where we're at, life continues. How do we become effective at sharing the gospel? How can, how can we reimagine what, what the church is capable of doing, even in the midst of this crazy time? And so it's exciting seeing some of these things begin to develop and unfold. Um, and just to reiterate what Pastor Ryan said, we would love to get more of you guys plugged in just because... Uh, things look different doesn't mean there's not places to serve and doesn't mean that there's not even new ministries that are starting. And so we would love for you to fill out one of those uh, uh, volunteer forms so that we know what are you passionate about? What do you enjoy? What are you gifted at doing? Um, any great electricians, you know, so that we can get you plugged in to a place where you can use your gifts and your passions and your skills to give back and to make a difference for the kingdom. So um, we, we would love to have you be a part of that. So we've been in a series in the book of, of Mark talking about the unexpected Jesus Christ. Um, the world wasn't ready for Jesus when he came. When he did come, the world didn't expect who they saw. They didn't expect him to come from the town he came from. They didn't expect him to do the things that he was doing. Everything about Christ is unexpected. His approach to ministry, his, the way that he approached people, the people that he invested in, right? The guys that he chose to be his disciples, everything was so unexpected. But I hope that as we've gone through this series, you've seen how much hope comes as a result of that unexpected. That Jesus had a plan for everybody. We ended last week with Jesus in the garden praying and finally telling his disciples to wake up. He's, we ended last week saying, my, my betrayer is coming. So if you remember last week, they, they had a meal together, right? And they were eating, and Jesus does this weird thing with the bread and the, the, the cup, and they're, they're trying to figure out what all of that means. And then they go outside, and, and they're, they're told again, one of you is going to betray me. You're all going to abandon me. Like, no, no, we would never do that, right? Then Jesus is in the garden, and he's praying this incredible prayer that's, that's so powerful. As he's praying to his father, he begins to sweat blood. And he says, God, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass from me. But your will, not mine. A powerful, powerful prayer, knowing that Christ knew what was coming, and he still chose to pray in that manner. So he says, my betrayer is coming, and that's where we pick up today. What unfolds is this crowd armed with weapons come following the high priest, and who is leading the pack? None other than Judas, one of his own disciples, one of the people that he just spent years with, seeing the miracles and seeing all that had happened. Somebody that, that decided several weeks earlier that he was going to turn Jesus over for just a little bit of money. So he comes in, and Jesus says this powerful statement, come, do what you came here to do, friend. And I just have to imagine the sting that that would have, have placed in the soul of Judas hearing that last word. Come, do what you did here to do, friend. And, and that reminder of the personal connection that Christ had and, and how personal this all really was. And, and then there's a small fight that ensues with some of the disciples getting, getting a little bit lively. Jesus kind of puts it, puts it to rest. And he said that this is so that scripture can be fulfilled. In other words, the will and the plan of God to redeem all of humanity and open the door to a relationship with himself for all of us. That's what this is for. And so Jesus is setting the stage to remind them this is the will of God. This is all part of the plan. And so we conclude today by looking at how Jesus' disciples respond to his arrest and then his resurrection. And true discipleship is a challenge but it's part of being a, a growing follower of Jesus Christ. See, these disciples didn't know exactly what they were signing up for. I don't think any of them, when they got out of their fishing boat three years earlier, expected this night to happen. I don't think any of them expected to see the miracles that they saw over those three years, to see the joy and all that took place, but also the heartache. I don't think any of them accepted to see the Savior of the world hanging on a cross, and then to be put into a tomb. Like, it's just, it had to have been absolutely mind-boggling. It's not what they expected, but that's the way that God works. In the midst of chaos and in the midst of confusion, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of frustration and, and political election seasons and all the stuff, God doesn't change. 
His plan doesn't change. His purpose doesn't change. His love for you and I does not change. Our calling doesn't change. And, and there's hope and there's peace that we can find in that. Because regardless of what's taking place in your life today, God's plan and purpose for you is the same as it was the day that you were born. His desire to be in relationship with you is the same that it has always been. His desire to use you to make an eternal difference in the lives of the people that are around you is the same that it's always been. Our job as a church 2,000 years later is the same that it has always been. There is nothing that's going to stop that. You have to think back through 2,000 years of, you, of human history. What has happened in our world? Wars and famines and disease and all of this stuff. But guess what? The purpose of the church remains the same. So has it changed today? Come on, has it changed today? Do we still have the same purpose to share hope and life and love with a dark, hurting world? To help people discover freedom and purpose and community with the God of the universe? Guys, that's an incredible opportunity and challenge that we have. Are we up to it? Are we excited about that? Is that something that gets you out of bed in the morning? We have to remain focused. We are going to be taking a look at two different sections in this last uh, part of the story today. The first I'm going to title Naked, and the second is Empty. So, do I have your attention now? We're, we're moving into the naked part. So, Mark 14, 50 through 52 reads this way. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. So for those of you who don't often wear a linen garment, basically what you can think of is like an adult diaper is kind of what it looked like, right? Like this linen wrapping. And so naturally, if you try to run with a towel tied around your waist, it's probably going to fall off, right? So that's kind of what we're seeing here. And, and, and so for me, as I'm reading that, um, again, remember, I spent a lot of years in youth ministry. And so... There's a lot of things that go through my mind, but, you know, as I'm reading this, okay, why is this young man wearing nothing but a linen garment um, out in public? Why, why did he run away? You know, and, and, and what, what did this scene look like? I, I don't actually want to visualize it, but in some ways, you know, I, it's just, it's kind of comical to me, yet it's, it's put in the middle of this very tense situation. And so reading through this, I was like, I wonder if Mark worked with teenagers, because that's, that's kind of the, the, the feeling that you get here. This, just, this is a weird story to include. What's the reason? So remember the way that, that Mark works, as we've seen throughout this series. He's, he's all about the big picture, helping us understand a larger concept. And so he's not very focused on a lot of the minor details. Yet when he adds minor details like this, there's a very good reason that he does it, because it adds something to the larger story. Remember last week how all of the disciples said, Jesus, you're wrong. We would never leave you. We would never forsake you. We would never deny you. Peter explained that even if everybody else would, he would never do so. He would even follow Christ to the death. And then everyone deserted him, and everyone fled. It's, it's, and it's it's one thing to, to just kind of turn your back on somebody, but it's a different thing to flee. And so when you go back to, um, to study that specific word, to flee, there's an implication of self-preservation there, that you're literally terrified for your life and so that you're trying to get away to preserve yourself. And so there's a very marked contrast there between what Jesus Christ was doing and, and what this young man was doing. There's a sense of selfishness and, and a desire to protect himself. And remember what we talked about last week with distractions. The desire to live isn't a bad thing, right? Um, the desire to avoid danger is also not a bad thing on its own. The problem comes when we place ourselves above the will of God. And, and we're wanting to run to protect ourselves, And to, maybe it's protect our image. Maybe it's protect our job, our finance, whatever that is. But in the process, we're turning our back on God. You see where the, the contrast is there. there. There's this connection where people, we need to be sure that Christ is truly our focus in all that we do. And, and it's something that I've had to wrestle with in my life where there's been things where I feel like God is working in me and, and pointing things out. I'm like, God, this isn't a bad thing. What, why, why do I feel guilty about it? Or why do I feel some type of anxiousness in my soul? 
And it's not because what I'm doing is some terrible sin, but maybe it's not what God needs me to do at that time. Maybe there's something different where God is preparing me or, or working in me that he needs to use me. I promise you that you will never regret any sacrifice you make when you place God first in your life. It'll be hard at times. There will be challenges, and and there will be times where you want to flee, where you want to run, where where maybe you think your life really is in danger. And and I'll be honest, maybe one of you is going to be called to the mission field. Maybe your life really will be in danger someday. But I promise you, there is so much waiting for you in that relationship with God that you would miss if you just run. And so I, I encourage all of us to press in and to say, God, what is it that you're calling me to do? What is it that you're stirring within me? What do you have me prepared to do? What have you created me for? And then pray for the courage to follow through in that. Because there's some days where it's a joy. And it feels like the greatest day of your life walking with Jesus. And things are just going fantastic. And, and you feel like he's heaping these blessings on you. And then there's days where you feel like, God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Where are you? Why is this all happening? I'm, I'm trying to follow you. I, I promise you, God is right there with you in the midst of it. We just have to trust that he's in the thick of it with us. So moving on, we find this odd section of the story where this young man wearing nothing but this linen garment, again, think of an adult cloth diaper, was following Jesus. And when they seize him, he flees and, and he's naked. He leaves the garment behind. So I spent a good deal of time studying and researching this because it intrigued me. And I wondered why it was included in this passage. And so there's several ideas of why Mark may have included this in the story. As to who this person is, one of the ideas that has the most support is that this is actually John Mark himself, the author of this book. Um, There's no way to identify that for certain. But when we ask, what does this mean? Many scholars believe that this isn't so much about the man as it is what it shows the contrast between what Jesus was doing and what this young man was doing. This young man's fleeing to protect himself because he's afraid his life is in danger. Yet Jesus Christ is walking right into the hands of an angry mob, fully obedient, getting ready to be crucified. And so there's this huge contrast that we see. And, um, you know, the, the man fleeing in, in shame and fear, yet Jesus Christ freely entering in to the same thing. Uh, others believe that this is echoing back to Amos 2.16, which says, Even the bravest warrior will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. Meanwhile, Jesus' predictions are coming true letter by letter by letter throughout this story as it unfolds. And and the next big chunk of scripture deals with the trial and the burial and then the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. This section is what is described as the passion. Have any, any of you ever heard that or maybe the movie Passion of the Christ? So the reason this is called the passion is because we have to go to the uh, late uh, Latin form of the word passio, which actually means to suffer. And so it's, it's the suffering of Christ on behalf of us. But I honestly think it works with our modern day translation of the word passion as well, which is this deep form of love and desire. And that's why Christ did what he did. It was this incredible desire to see all of humanity restored into a relationship. It was an incredible love where he was willing to sacrifice all of that for you and for I. And so we have this passion scene that unfolds. And then following the death of Christ on the cross, he's placed in a tomb. Because it was the Sabbath with the the Jewish laws and traditions, they weren't able to go prepare the body for a proper burial the way that they would typically do. And so here he is placed in a tomb. The rock is rolled in front of it because they didn't want any funny business happening. And, you know, somebody trying to steal the body, they'd heard rumors of a resurrection. And and so they made sure that that wasn't going to happen. And this is where we're going to pick up the rest of our story today, where we go from the naked section to the empty section. Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go anoint Jesus' body. 
Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So this is where we wrap up the book of Mark. And for the sake of this message, we're going to be ending in verse 8 because most scholars believe that's originally where the book of Mark actually ended. Um, and, and that's a, a message for another day. But the, the reason being is when you look at the, the following passages, there's a very big shift in uh, the construction of the, the word usage, the verbs, and they believe that that was probably a later addition by um, a, a scribe trying to connect that to the rest of the Gospels. Um, and so when you look at the earliest manuscripts dating back the closest to the original time frame, it ends in verse 8. And so as I was looking through that and kind of studying that, I'm like, that's, that's a very odd way to end this story. The last sentence is, they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. There's no closure. Like, that's kind of what, when you're watching a movie and it just stops to be continued, right? It, it's, it kind of gives us that same feel. And again, I, I love the way that Mark writes because it's everything he does is intentional. It's kind of jumping around. It's a little bit all over the place, but there's a reason. This is where we wrap up today, and, and I think that there is a very good reason for that. Some people find it strange, but... The big takeaway, the big message that Mark wants us to understand, the tomb was empty, right? So the prophecy had been fulfilled. Jesus Christ was supposed to be there dead. That's what these women went expecting to see, and he wasn't. This, this is completely different. And so Mark isn't worried about all the little details that come later. The tomb was empty, the end, right? Like, and, but for us, we're probably saying, okay, well, well what happens next, right? And, and we have the other gospels. We have the book of Acts that expound on that. And so we know the rest of the story. But, but that's the thing. Mark knew what he was writing about. He wanted you to understand who Jesus was, what he did, and that the tomb was empty. Because, and what do we infer from that? The story's not over. The story is not over. One thing to notice is that Mark makes it clear that the women went out, they bought the spices, they were prepared to go prepare Jesus' body for burial. This indicates that they hadn't really taken seriously the message of the resurrection. Um, many believers at the time, it said, were kind of thinking that this was more um, an analogy to the future someday resurrection of all believers. Well, of course Christ is going to be raised when, when all of us are, right? They, they didn't fully understand he's literally talking about three days. Like, you know, because when you look through the way that Jesus spoke, there was a lot of allegory and a lot of stories, and, and he wanted people to ask questions and, and to begin to dig deeper and understand. And so there was a little bit of ambiguity. So, so these women are, are doing what they could to go honor Jesus Christ. And, and what I think is so powerful about that is rather than say, oh, look at these women and their lack of faith. The reality is they had so much faith that even expecting to find Jesus dead in the tomb, they still went. And it still didn't rock their faith. And it still didn't make them doubt. Other people, when he died on the cross, many of them were doubting, saying, oh, this couldn't have been it. We were wrong. Yet these women go, even knowing they're going to find him in the tomb, saying, this was still Jesus Christ. There's still a plan. It's still working out. My faith has not been shaken. That's incredible. That's incredible faith that these women showed. Even in that, though, they were going. They weren't even shook. Their faith in him was secure. And think about the, um, the power and the level of faith that that would take on our behalf if you put yourself in that same situation. 
We notice that these women were also very important because, again, if, if we understand the culture of the day, women didn't have a very high value in society. So it would have been completely acceptable for Mark to say, a group of ladies went to do this, right? Like, who it is isn't really important. But it was important to Mark. In fact, in the book of Mark, we see three different times where these women are named by name. Specifically, their stories told for generation after generation in the account of the gospel because their part in this is significant. Now, now think about this. God goes through the trouble to send an angel to these ladies to explain what had happened. Who is the first people to preach the message of the resurrection, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Three ladies. Unexpected, right? Women didn't have a high value in the society, but who did God reveal himself to? Who were the first preachers of the gospel? Three very unexpected women. And again, that's the beauty of the way that Jesus Christ works, is every single one of us is important in the story of the gospel. Every single one of us plays a part. What would have happened if those women wouldn't have been obedient and wouldn't have gone? Who would have shared that message? What would that have looked like? How much more time would it have taken? Who would have been a witness to the fact that the tomb was empty? It's incredible to think that you and your story and the part that you play can be that significant. Are there people who, if you don't choose to share the gospel, may never hear that message? Or maybe they'll hear it, but they're going to hear it different from you because of your relationship with them. Is there something, some passion that God is, is stirring up in you and saying, I need you to serve? And there's a vacancy where if you don't step in, it's not going to be fulfilled. We all have this incredible privilege and opportunity to be used by God if we are willing. So the women arrive expecting to find Jesus laying here dead, and they realize that the stone has, has been moved. They're shocked to see that. They walk in, and what do they see? The tomb is empty, and there's this young man in a white robe, and he says, don't be alarmed. Jesus has risen. So the angel confirms that they're in the right place. He, they know that he's, she, he knows that they're here looking for Jesus. So he's saying, yes, you've come to the right spot. But he's not here. You're not going to find him. He has risen. And throughout scripture, it's interesting. We see any time an angel approaches somebody, what do they say? Don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Don't be worried. Why do you think that is? How, how many of you have seen cartoons or drawings or sculptures of angels? You know, there are always these beautifully, you know, fit physique, buff, you know, beautiful wings. And if you read the book of Revelation and, and the description of, of heavenly beings, it's absolutely gruesome and terrifying. And so as you put that into perspective, you can understand maybe this is why the angels always say, don't be alarmed, don't be afraid. Um, it's not what you probably expect to see. At least that's how I imagine this. I, I don't know what this guy looked like, but that's what went through my head. I think that this tells us something, though, that it, it's a powerful experience when God sends his messenger to send an incredible message like this saying, do not be worried. So they don't see Jesus. His grave is empty. Not only is a grave empty, but they're told he has risen. And, and this is new. It's never been done before. See, remember, they know the, the miracles that Jesus has done, right? He's raised people from the dead, which is pretty incredible. How many of you have seen somebody in front of you raised from the dead? I haven't. But, but this is different because now the one who did the raising was dead and raised himself from the dead. This isn't some outside force. He, he did it himself. He overcame death. He overcame sin. There's literally no way that death has power anymore because it couldn't stop him. He raised himself. He overcame that. See, before sin was a death sentence, it completely separated us from God, yet God broke the veil away with Christ when Christ became that sin. He didn't just feel the guilt. He literally became sin so that when he died on the cross, sin died. The power of sin died and the power of death died, making it so that any of us have the opportunity to truly live in freedom, something that had never been done before. Death is no longer a period. It's a transition to eternity. And, and there's incredible power in that. Your sin is not a death sentence damning you to hell forever. 
Because God has given you the power to move beyond that because he's already offered the forgiveness. All you have to do is say, I'm done. God, I accept that forgiveness and I want to live changed. I want to be a different person. There's so much power in that. None of us are captive. That's why this is called breaking the chains and being set free. Nothing can hold us because God has already won. And if we are in him, he is in us, and we are a new creation, no longer bound by all of this stuff, no longer bound by sin, no longer bound by death, set free from the burden of sin. And, a, and now we have the ability to live free in him. It's incredible, and that's the news that these women are told, go share with the world. These are the original missionaries. These are the original pastors. This is where the church started. That's why this story ends in such an obscure place, because it's not over. It's still being written in this room and around the world. We are a continuation of that story. So it, how do we want that story to end? How is that story going to end for you and your children and your grandchildren? How is that story going to end for your coworkers and for your neighbor and for the person down the street and that guy that really bugs you? How is that story going to end for our leaders and our politicians? How are we going to respond as a church? Guys, we have an incredible opportunity to share the most amazing message that's ever been told. We need to make sure that we're excited about this, though. We need to make sure that we're more passionate about this than we are anything else in life. There's other hobbies I have. There's other things I enjoy doing, like putting up shelves, right? But this should take the cake. This should be where, where, where it all ends. Everything else, eh, if I've got some free time, I'll do that. But this is my focus. This is my goal. I want people to get it. I want people to understand. I want people to feel what I felt. I want people to know the forgiveness that I've experienced. I want to make sure that when I die and make that transition, that my life is counted for something. Something that's going to last beyond, you know, the little things I piddle with here on earth. But something that's going to make a real difference. Throughout scripture, we see this message over and over again. You are my disciples. You will build the church. You will carry this message. You will continue. In fact, later in Acts, we see when Christ is ascended, he said, don't be worried. I'm sending one even stronger than myself to be with you. The same spirit that was in Christ is guiding the church today. Are we going with that boldness and that confidence? Are we continuing to take that message? So after something like this, you may be tempted, at, you know, seeing this angel, if you're putting yourself in this story, to just kind of sit back and say, I need to collect myself. This is a little bit crazy. And it is. But they're told, go tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So one point to make here that's, that's interesting is, again, Peter. We see Peter keeps showing up in, in odd ways in this story. Remember, Peter is the one who Jesus said, on you I'm going to build my church. Peter is the one who Jesus called and had this incredible relationship with. Yet Peter is the one who ends up denying Christ. And, and in that, remember how Jesus referred to him as Simon for that moment, saying, almost as a reminder, you're slipping back to who you were. You are not that man anymore. I've given you a new name. I've given you a new identity, and I've given you a new purpose. Folks, that's true for all of us. If we've accepted Christ... We're no longer that person we were. Don't fall back to who that was. Don't fall back to the same old mistakes, the same old patterns, the same old habits, the same old distractions. Be the new person that God created you to be. Live into that identity. So here this angel says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Remember, Peter was absolutely heartbroken after all of this unfolded. Yet God had a specific plan to show an incredible amount of love and forgiveness for Peter. So, as he denies Christ, but Jesus also made it clear earlier that Peter is crucial. He's pivotal. That he is the one who's going to build up the church. That he's the one that's going to press this message forward. And it also sets the stage for the encounter later where Jesus 
comes and reminds Peter of his love for him and his forgiveness for him. It's a beautiful story that we see later through the scripture. But back to our girls that we were talking about earlier. They are going to share this incredible news. But according to Mark, they leave scared and confused. Mark says that they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And, and that's it. That's all we got. That's all Mark gives us. But in that strange way, you know, as I was studying that last sentence, we have to go back and, and look at the, the original context and the original language. So some people say, well, these women absolutely failed. You know, see, that's why women aren't in ministry. They, they didn't do it. And, and I don't think that that's a, a good interpretation here. Because w- what we see is, is really studying the original Greek. What this is saying is they were terrified and, and most likely thought people would think they were crazy. So they went, found the disciples. They didn't say a word to anyone else. They fulfilled the mission. They told the disciples. They told Peter. But they weren't broadcasting this, you know, to everybody that they saw. Because one, they were women. Two, it's a crazy story. And they probably weren't sure exactly how to handle it. So either way, we see that the story isn't over. Those at the time and, and those of us reading today with the aid of Matthew and and Luke and the book of Acts, know that these women did go and they did tell the story, that that they did proclaim this message, that Jesus did interact with both the disciples and with Peter, and he restored that relationship in a beautiful way, forgiving Peter and saying, I understand your weakness. That's why I came, but I've overcome, and it's okay, and I love you, and I have a purpose for you. Get up, dust yourself off, and let's do what I created you to do. How many of you need to hear that from Christ today? It's okay. I know you've fallen. Dust yourself off. Pull yourself together and let's go. We still have a purpose. We still have a plan. And look at the way the world has changed over the last 2,000 years as a result of this faithfulness. Church, you have the ability to have that same kingdom impact if you're willing if we're obedient. So, so just as Jesus' original disciples were invited to join him again in Galilee, readers then and now are also invited to join the crucified Lord Jesus Christ in his mission to redeem the world. We are a continuation. The book of Mark ends in an odd way because it doesn't actually end there. That portion of the story ends. But the church continues. The bride of Christ continues. Our purpose Continues. We are writing it day by day. What story are we telling? How are we fulfilling our calling? We do this in confidence that the risen and ascended Jesus Christ truly is the Lord. And through his spirit, he's going to lead us, his followers and his church, on mission into the world. And that the ultimate good purpose of God will prevail in the end. There is no way for it to fail because it's already succeeded. And so what we need to do then, church, is go with that boldness and that confidence into a world that needs to hear the message. There is no questioning how is this going to end and how is it going to play out and what is it going to look like we know. The question for us is how are we going to continue writing this story? Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you, Lord, for this incredible day and these incredible people and friends that that we get to come together and worship with God. God, we thank you for everybody tuning in online and and on the radio that's listening in, Lord. God, I pray that you would continue to, to gather your church. God, that you'd continue to equip and prepare and call and gather your people to make a difference. God, I know that that when I really sit down and think about life and what is this all about and what am I doing, God, I don't want to be wasting time. I don't want to be just sitting around and going through the motions. God, I want my life to count for something. I want to make a difference in every moment, in every interaction, at at every conversation I have, and barbecue that I attend, and, and person that I'm hanging out with. God, I pray that I would look for the opportunities to share you in in the words that I use, in the actions that I have, God, even sometimes in the way that I just listen. And Lord, I pray that as a church that would be indicative of who we are, that that would be our reputation in this community and God around the world, that Tillamook Nazarene would be known as a group of people who are absolutely passionate about Jesus and about other people, that we would love people with the love that you have, God, that that we would have a true concern for others, God, that we would desire to see them find freedom 
and purpose, Lord, that we would invite them in with open arms, that as they grow in their faith, we help them find their place to serve and to see that, God, you have a plan to use them as well. Lord, we thank you for the second chances where you just gently pick us up, dust off our knees and say, it's all right, let's keep going. Lord, I know some of us need to hear that today. God, I pray that you would give us the courage to turn away from the distractions and all of the stuff that's trying to pull our attention from you, Lord, and that we would truly put our relationship with you first, God. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified by the praise and worship we bring, by the way that we live our lives, by what we do as a church, Lord. Help us to make a difference. Help us to be a church on mission, looking for opportunities to change the world. Help us to remember that this life isn't all that there is and that death isn't a period, God, but it's a transition. Lord, I pray that we would be preparing ourselves and others to transition well. That, God, we would live life to the fullest here today, fully living in your forgiveness and grace and mercy, helping others to do the same and preparing those to enter into eternity with you. God, we love you and we give you the glory and it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Thanks for being here, guys, and see you next week.